I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. God, we thank you that you are the stronghold of our lives. And when we are in you, we are secure. So Lord, we join with the psalmist today to declare that our hearts are glad and our whole being rejoices because we are with you. And even our flesh dwells secure for you will not abandon your people. You will not abandon our souls to Sheol or let your Holy One see decay. You make known to us the path of life and in your presence there is fullness of joy. So as we gather as your people in your name in this place, we also pray that in your presence there would be a fullness of joy. Fill our hearts to the overflow with the joy that comes from knowing you as our Lord. God, we also pray blessings over all the nations that are represented here today, from South Africa to South America, throughout the Middle East, throughout the UK, the US, Canada. We ask, God, for your spirit to bless these nations with the gospel and that the church would grow strong. And above all else, God, we pray for hearts that would be fixated upon you to love you and honor you more. God, I also ask that you would ready our senses to be fully engaged with your presence and your voice here today. Fill me, God, with your spirit. Anoint me, empower me, preach through me today so that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be pleasing in your sights. O oh Lord, our rock, our redeemer. And it is in that precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. You know, one thing to always remember, and it is a leadership principle, and it is a life principle that we must adhere to often, it is to remember that the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. Now, this is an important reminder because many people and many organizations will forget the main thing. They will be distracted, they'll forget, uh, they will be detoured away from the primary purpose of why they existed. Because there's one thing about mission and vision is that these elements tend to leak out of the minds of people. And so it's important to remind ourselves time and time again what the main thing of our lives should be. One example of this is Harvard University. Oh, Harvard, the dream of so many Asian parents and the nightmare of so many Asian students. Did you know that their original motto and seal of Harvard was this phrase, truth for Christ and the church? Did you know that that was their original motto and the seal uh, of which the school stood for? It was part of their seal since 1692. Now, Harvard University was founded in 1636 with the intention of training Christian ministers. I don't know if you knew this. And in accordance with that vision, Harvard wrote out its rules and precepts of how they were to do school and do training for the students. Th these are the exact words from their rules and precepts book. Uh, Let every student be plainly instructed and earnestly pressed to consider well the main end of his life and studies is to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life. John 17, 3. This is straight from their manual. And therefore, to lay Christ in the bottom as the only foundation of all sound knowledge and learning. And seeing the Lord only giveth wisdom, let everyone seriously set himself by prayer in secret to seek it of him. Proverbs 2, 3. Next paragraph in the Harvard's original rules and regulation manual. Next paragraph was this. Everyone shall so exercise himself in reading the scriptures twice a day that he shall be ready to give such an account of his proficiency therein both in theoretical observations of language and logic and in practical and spiritual truths as his tutor shall require. According to his ability, seeing the entrance of the word giveth light it giveth understanding to the simple, Psalm 119, 130. 
fascinating that this is how Harvard was founded. Isn't that amazing to know that this institution that is world-renowned for its academic excellence, it started with a desire to raise up men and women of God towards that same excellence. That is why the school was created. But we see that eventually they lost sight of the main thing. And now the main thing is nowhere to be seen. And so that is why it is important to keep the main thing the main thing. Because we very often times will forget what that pri pri priority needs to be within our lives. And Peter today, he is reminding the suffering church of what that main thing needs to be for believers. Because especially when you are suffering, you are prone to get distracted from what the primary purpose in life is. And so turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to be looking at verses 10 and following as we can, uh, continue our study through the letter of 1 Peter. And today, uh, Peter will remind us the true points of it all, and that is Jesus. So follow along with me in your outlines as well. And today, uh, we'll learn a few things about what the main point of our lives is. And the first thing that we learn is that the scriptures point us to Jesus. So everyone repeat, the scriptures point us to Jesus. So let's look at 1 Peter 1, verse 10. Now concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully. So concerning this salvation that we have, that is ours in Christ because of the death and resurrection of Jesus on the cross, the prophets of the Old Testament, it says that they studied and searched and inquired Scripture carefully. And what did they find? Verse 10 also tells us that they found grace. Now, you, now, you see, some will say, isn't the Old Testament filled with God's wrath? But the New Testament is filled with God's love? But what we need to understand is all Scripture is filled with God's grace. A careful study of Scripture will lead you to find grace through Jesus. But some will still say, doesn't the Old Testament show us so much of God's anger and wrath? Yes, but God's wrath towards sin shows us how serious God takes sin. You see, sin is not something to be laughed at. It is something that deserves death. And the Old Testament shows us time and time again our inability to keep the law. That was the ultimate purpose of God providing the law. His standard is something that we cannot attain by ourselves. So the law was given to show us we fall short of that standard and therefore we need a savior instead. So through the perfect standard of God's law, we are drawn to be in need of God's mercy and his grace. So through the perfect standard that was shown through Old Testament scripture, and by proving that we cannot keep the law by ourselves, it is showing us we cannot save ourselves. So turn to somebody next to you and say, we cannot save ourselves. All right, so that's an important truth that you need to know. Because you are not saved by your church attendance. You are not saved by being good. You are not saved by doing nice things and avoiding swearing and avoiding all these bad things. We cannot save ourselves. Amen? And that's an important truth that you need to know. That being good is actually impossible apart from God. And so because the breaking of the law deserves punishment and the wages of sin is death, God provided a way, a sacrifice to take our punishment. He made a way for sins to be forgiven, for punishment to be given to a sacrificial lamb that would absorb God's wrath and give us peace instead. So all scripture is a message of grace through faith in Christ. An important verse that you need to know, understand about this principle is Luke chapter 24, verse 27. I provided that for you in your outlines. Can we read that together? Ready, begin. 
And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. So this verse is speaking of Jesus when he was on the road to Emmaus. After he resurrected, he met some disciples who were walking on the side of the road. He engaged in their conversations. And he was telling the disciples how all scripture, and for them it was the Old Testament, and he says, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, meaning Moses representing the law, the first five books of the Bible, so all of the law and all of the prophets actually point us to Christ. So he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. You see, Jesus is the ultimate answer to all the redemptive themes within the Bible. Jesus fulfills all the writings of the prophets. 1 Peter 1, 10 and 11. Jesus fulfills all the ceremonial laws and the writings. Hebrews chapter 10. Jesus fulfills all the moral laws. Matthew 3, 15. Jesus fulfills all of the character types that point us to the Messiah in the Old Testament from Adam to Joseph to Moses to David to Elijah. Jesus is the fulfillment of all of Israel's history. Galatians 3, 16, 17, Hosea 11, 1, Matthew 2, 15. So all of Scripture points us to Jesus, including the Old Testament, so that we might know Jesus is the promised Messiah who came to save the world from its sin. But the purpose of the writings isn't just so that we might know about him and know knowledge about him, but the purpose of these writings in Scripture is ultimately so that we might truly know him, the author of the writings. You see, one of the blessings of books is that we get to interact with the mind and the thoughts of an author, even though we have never met them. Uh, so even though C.S. Lewis passed away, when we read his books, we can interact with his mind and start to see how he thinks about certain topics. So that's one of the blessings of books. You could interact with the author to a certain extent, even though you never met them and even though they may have passed away. And, in for, and for similar reasons, I'd actually like to write more books in the future and even put a lot of my sermon series into a book format, especially for my son Enoch and his children and his children and even their grandchildren as well. Why? So that they would be able to uh, read the thought process of my interaction with God's Word uh, so that I can still teach them even though I never meet them. So that even if I die, I can still teach my children, my grandchildren, and even further generations uh, of what it was like for me to go on this faith journey with Jesus. So that's a blessing that books can offer. Um, but as great as that can be, it's one thing to know a book and its contents. It's another thing to know its author. Because this book of the Bible is meant to lead us to know the author. You see, the Bible is not given just to increase our knowledge, but to increase our intimacy to know the heart and the mind of God who authored Scripture. So the reason why the revelation of God's Word was given to us was so that we might come to know God who wrote Scripture. So as you read scripture, remember that the purpose of scripture is to lead you to Jesus. So Peter shows us today that all the scriptures point us to Jesus. But not only that, we also learn that the sufferings point us to Jesus. So everyone repeat, the sufferings point us to Jesus. Now what sufferings am I talking about? Two in particular. The sufferings that the Messiah went through point us to Jesus being the fulfillment of the prophecies of the Messiah, but also the sufferings that we will experience in this world is meant to point us and bring us to Jesus as well. First Peter chapter 1, let's look at verse 10 again before we look at verse 11. Concerning the salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched 
and inquired carefully, verse 11, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. So one of the things that many Jews, including the disciples at first, didn't realize was that the Messiah was meant to suffer and to die on the cross. You see, the Jews of their day thought the coming Messiah would be a political king who would overthrow the oppressive leadership of their day. So when they thought that Jesus was the Messiah, in their mind, they wanted to crown him king and hopefully through his power would destroy the government of their day. So when Jesus would speak of how he needs to suffer and die, the disciples didn't understand and didn't even like it, especially Peter. Right? Peter would rebuke Jesus and says, no, may it never be. And how does Jesus reply to that? He says, get behind me, Satan. Right? And uh, I'm sure Peter really appreciated that. Right? Uh, but one of the things that we see in the Old Testament, especially in places like Isaiah 53, is that the Messiah is also meant to be the suffering servant. Our Lord, our Master, who we follow, is the suffering servant. So if you look at Isaiah 53, verses 4 to 6, it says, Surely he has borne our griefs. Okay, so the Messiah would carry our griefs. And carried our sorrows. He carries our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him uh, stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our sins and transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And so this prophetic word from Isaiah 53 about the coming Messiah, the Savior of the world, clearly says that he will be crushed, he will be pierced, he will be bruised, he will be... Uh, suffering for all the sins of mankind. Now, what's also encouraging and fascinating to note about these verses concerning the Messiah, like in Isaiah 53, verse 4, it tells us he carried our griefs and our sorrows, not just our sins. That is fascinating. So it means if you are in Christ, you do not cry alone. You do not suffer alone. You do not grieve alone. Because the suffering servant weeps and hurts with you. What a mighty God we serve. Who does not distance himself from our pain and our suffering. As many of us would do. When we see the poor on the streets. When we see the suffering in the screens of our TV and of our computer screens. We want to distance ourselves from them. It makes us uncomfortable. It makes us also feel unworthy. It makes us somehow also feel lesser if we are interacting with people who are in so much pain. But not our God. He not only draws near. He becomes a suffering servant. So that he can be a God of compassion. One who suffers with his people. And that is part of the good news that the Messiah came to bring. That the God of the universe who not only will carry your sins, he will carry your sorrows, your griefs, and your tears with him. What an awesome God. We serve. Amen? Every curse and every consequence because of sin that happens in our lives, he carries. He carries not just in his body, not just on his hands and his feet. He carries the consequences of pain that we feel because of this fallen world. He carries not just on his hands and his feet and his body, he carries in his heart. Because what happened at the cross was not just an act of law. It was not just a legal action taking place. It was love in action taking place. 
He was not only making us right with God, he was not only canceling the curse of sin, he was displaying that in the midst of our brokenness and sin, it was Jesus saying, I want to suffer with you, weep with you, and adopt you to be my own because I love you. That is what Jesus was showing us when he died on the cross. What an awesome God we serve. What an awesome Savior we have in Jesus. No other God, no other God in all the world's religions, in all the world's books, could even create or fathom this kind of compassion and grace. Amen? You see, the cross is where grace and truth meet. It was love and action. But the sufferings and the griefs that we face in this world, they point us to Jesus because it shows us that this world is not right in its current form. Something is desperately wrong. The beheadings done by terrorists, the viruses that no one has a cure for, racism and hatred manifested by police and restaurant owners. All these injustices show us the human heart is sinful and in desperate need of Jesus to transform and to save. All of these wrongs that we see, all of these injustices show us the need for Jesus to break through into these lives. He carries our sorrows and he carries all who are in sorrow. And I'm light of, in light of that, I'm be, as a Korean descent person to all the African descent brothers and sisters here, I want to apologize for the extremely racist signs that were posted in Itaewon by certain bar owners. That is an injustice and the church is meant to also display grace, mercy, and truth in light of the love of Jesus Christ. Amen? And so I want to speak that into our African community today. He carries our sorrows and he carries all who are in sorrow so that in Christ we give him our sins. And you know what he gives to us? His righteousness. We give him our sorrows and he gives us joy. We give him our mourning and he turns that into dancing. That is the transformational power that happens at the foot of the cross. That is the great exchange that happens when lives surrender at the foot of the cross on which Jesus died. We give him garbage. He gives us glory. Amen? Luke 24, 45 and following says, Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And this is continuing on in the road to Emmaus. Jesus speaking to the disciples. He opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations. Beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. The sufferings of the Messiah, the sufferings of the cross, they point us to Jesus. In fact, the nail-scarred hands and feet prove to us that Jesus was the Messiah because all throughout Scripture, it uh, points us to the Messiah who would be pierced and bruised for the sins of mankind. And so the way Jesus died, the suffering in which he took when he died, it is proof of the Old Testament prophecies of the coming Messiah. And so his sufferings prove to us that Jesus was the Messiah. You know, when I first started playing guitar in high school, I did it more out of necessity for our youth group praise team more than just a personal desire. Because back then, for a while, um, I, would, I led praise when I was in high school, and I led just with vocals. And uh, we realized we eventually needed an instrument to cover over my voice. And so 
Uh, just listening to my voice was not a blessing to people. So、uh, I needed to learn how to play guitar very quickly. But one of the things that I did not expect while I was learning how to play guitar was how much my fingertips would hurt. So any of you who's ever started, you will know that your fingertips start to hurt a lot, and you start to develop calluses、uh, and scars and scabs. Uh, because that's one way to tell a guitarist. You see, one way you could tell a guitarist is not by the hair length, okay?、Uh, not by the color of their T-shirts. It is by、uh, just checking their fingertips. Because one of the things I realized afterwards, man, it's like we never use our fingertips. You, know, you never use them.、Uh, but when you start playing guitar, you do.、Um, and as you play guitar, it's constantly in use. And then you develop the scabs and the scars and the calluses to show that you've been playing. So that scab becomes proof that you are connected to playing this instrument. And in a similar way, the scars on the hands and the feet of Jesus prove to us that He is the Savior of the world. But the scars and the sufferings are not the end of the story. For Christ, the suffering servant. Verse eleven of First Peter one also says, "Inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted." Now look at this: when Scriptures predicted the sufferings of Christ, yes, but also the subsequent glories. So the cross is not the end of the story. Our sufferings are not the end of the story. The end of the story ends with glory. The crucifixion is not the end. Not even the resurrection is the end for followers of Jesus. The end for Jesus is eternal glorification, praise, and honor to the one who died but lives again. The one who came to take away the sins of the world, and also for us, those who carry the cross. And follow him, will have calluses from the cross, from holding it often, because we too we walk the paths of the cross. Cross, yes, we take up our crosses and follow Jesus, yes, but we must also remember that Jesus, and for all who follow him, the cross comes first, yes, but and then the crown. There is a cross we must bear, and then there will be a crown we will wear. The cross comes before the crown. And look at the end of verse eleven of First Peter one again. So, predicting the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. Cross first, glory follow. For Jesus, and for all who follow Him, Amen. That is our future as well. Do you realize that? That that is your future. Eternal glory and honor for trusting and treasuring Jesus. So the Scriptures point us to Jesus, and the sufferings point us to Jesus, but also. What we learn in this passage, in terms of keeping the main thing, the main thing, the saints are to point others to Jesus as well. So, everyone, repeat: the saints are to point others to Jesus. So, all of Scripture they point us to Jesus. All suffering that Jesus endured point us that He is. The true Messiah. All our sufferings that we experience in this world are to draw us to Jesus, because we need Him for healing, restoration, and redemption. And also, the saints are to point others to Jesus. So, what is the end result of all Scripture and all the sufferings pointing us to Jesus? The point is that we too are to point others to Jesus. First Peter chapter one verse twelve says it was revealed to them. That they were serving not themselves but you. And speaking of the prophets who are studying Scripture and preaching Scripture, it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you. In the things that you have that have now been announced to you through those who have preached the good news to you. 
by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven things into which angels long to look. So the prophets of of old were serving us, all of us who benefited from from their study of Scripture by pointing us to Jesus. You see, the purpose of all preaching is to point people to Jesus. The purpose of all Bible teaching, the purpose of all Bible studies and our small group studies is to point others to Jesus. The purpose of all of our evangelism and missions work and our justice ministries, the ultimate aim is to point people to Jesus, to declare and to demonstrate the gospel of Jesus Christ. And again, looking at Luke 24, verse 45 and 48, then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem, you are witnesses of these things. So the reason we are saved is so that we might proclaim the message of repentance and forgiveness of sins in his name to all nations. That is why we exist. That is our purpose of why we are still on this planet. Also in Mark chapter 16, and he said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. So this is our message and this is our mission. And we are here to finish the mission that he gave to us. You know, one of my friends in high school, his name was Mark, and uh, he was one grade and one um, age above me, and uh, one time we were, he was a believer, and we were both part of our high school Bible study, and one time when we were having lunch, I saw on top of his folder a list of names, and on top of it, it had the title Love List, and I asked Mark, Mark, who are these names? Uh, People that you are in love with? Um, He said, no. Uh, These are people that I... Uh, pray for um, because at the beginning of each school semester he creates a list his love list and uh, he prays for these people and he looks for opportunities to share the love and the gospel of Jesus Christ with them and so um, he was doing this throughout his high school years and he brought many people to know the Lord throughout those years and uh, whenever somebody comes to know the Lord he will uh, scratch that name off and he'll write another name below Uh, to keep that love list going. So it was a beautiful testimony uh, to see a student, a fellow student, who also had focus on why he was there as a believer in our school as well. Who would be on your love list? Who are the people in your life today that you need to pray for and pursue with the love and the gospel of Jesus Christ? You see, my friend Mark, he knew his role as a student was to study, yes. But he also knew his role as a believer also dictated the focus of his life. And part of that focus as a believer was to share the love and the gospel of Jesus Christ to others. He knew he was saved for a reason, and that was to show Jesus to others. And what's the point of your life? The point of your life is to point people to Jesus. Amen? You see, that is why we must be committed to finishing the task that Christ has given to us. And that's why when we do missions, short-term and long-term missions, we focus on unreached and unengaged people groups of the world. We focus on the most vulnerable groups within our communities. But especially to those who have never heard of the name Jesus, and his gospel, we need to give them a chance to hear and respond to this life-saving message. With over two billion people still living in unreached places on this earth, we need the church in this hour to keep the main thing, the main thing, and that is to point the nations to Jesus. So don't get distracted. Don't lose your mission. Don't lose your purpose. Don't lose the point of your life, which is to point the nations to Jesus. So through your job, through your finances, through your prayers, your relationships, your vacations, learn to keep the main thing the main thing and bring glory to Jesus as you draw people to him. 
You know, when I was in seminary, it was one of the first times that one of my best friends was about to get married. And he asked me to be one of the groomsmen, and I was super excited because this was going to be my first time as a groomsman, first time wearing a tuxedo, first time for a lot of stuff. So I was really excited until I actually got there, and I asked, KJ, man, what do I need to do? He said, oh, just stand there. So my excitement turned into boredom really quick uh, because in the U.S., um, the role of groomsmen is basically just to wear a tuxedo and to stand there, you know. Uh, but me and my friends, so we had about six of us just standing there. Uh, but none of us complained. Why? Uh, because it's not about us. And if you get chosen to be a bridesmaid or a groomsman, it's not about you, right? It's not your day. It's their day. But I did hear on the female side some complaining. Some of the females were like, hey, these bridesmaid dresses are ugly. And I was like, it's okay that it's ugly. Because it's not about you. And that would be pretty messed up if as a bridesmaid you looked better than the bride. Like, that's messed up. And so you know what? Just top secret. I know of some girls, that's why they pick ugly, uh, ugly bridesmaid dresses, okay? <laughs> Shh. You didn't hear that from me, okay? Because uh, you see, even the way they stand in Western style weddings with the groomsmen, the bridesmaids, something, you know, three, four, five, fifteen, twenty-five, you know, however many they have. They just stand there. But how they stand also functions as an arrow. So that all eyes, when they go up front, get focused onto the bride and the groom because it's their day. It's about them. So it's okay that you just stand there. And that you look ugly. And that you just look at them because you are to function as an arrow to point to the center of attention. John the Baptist said the same thing. He said, I must decrease and he must increase. He must become greater, I must become less in reference to Jesus. He says, I'm just the messenger pointing people to the one who is the good news. And that is Jesus Christ. You see, the end of all of life, the point of all of life, is to bring glory and honor to God. As we point our hearts and our affections and our desires to Jesus, as we fix our eyes on Jesus, and as we point the world to the only one who is worthy to be lived for, and that is Jesus. That is the point of our lives, and that is the point of this world, so that we might all simply be an arrow pointing to the one who is worthy to be known, loved, treasured, cherished, and lived for. The point is the point to Jesus for all our days. Amen? Let's pray.